what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleam, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous night for the Thank you for coming to what we're showing here, Medal of Honor winner, over and due from the past. Be seated. I will now read this citation as it is written on the plaque that will be hanging in our illustrious bar area here at the Memorial Building. James Edwin Johnson, Sergeant, United States Marine Corps, Company J, 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines, 1st Marine Division, Udom Nai Korea, 2 December 1950, declared missing in action on 2 December 1950, and killed in action as of November 1953. Medal of Honor citation reads as follows. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty while serving as a squad leader in the Provisional Rifle Platoon composed of artillerymen attached to Company J in action against enemy aggressive forces, vastly outnumbered by the well-entrenched and cleverly concealed enemy force, wearing the uniforms of our friendly troops and attacking, <coughs> and attacking his platoon's open and unconcealed positions. Sergeant Johnson unhesitantly took charge of his platoon in the absence of the leader and exhibiting great personal valor in the face of heavy barrage of hostile fire. Cooley proceeded to move among his men, shouting words of encouragement and inspiration and skillfully directing their fire. Ordered to displace his platoon during the firefight, he immediately placed himself in an extremely hazardous position from which he could provide covering fire for his men. Fully aware of his voluntary action meant either certain death or capture to himself, he courageously continued to provide effective cover for his men and was last observed in a wounded condition, single-handedly engaging enemy troops in close hand-to-hand -hand combat with hand grenades and also fighting hand-to-hand. -hand. By his valiant and inspiring Leadership Sergeant Johnson was directly responsible for the successful completion of the platoon's displacement and saving the lives of many. His dauntless fighting spirit and unfaltering devotion to duty in the face of terrific odds reflect the highest credit upon himself and the United States Naval Service 
and the United States Marine Corps. Those who have served and those currently serving in the uniformed services of the United States are ever mindful that the sweetness of enduring peace has always been tainted by the bitterness of personal sacrifice. We are compelled to never forget that while we enjoy our daily pleasures, there are others who have endured and may still be enduring the agony of pain deprivation, and imprisonment. Before we begin our activities, we pause to recognize our POWs and MIAs. We call your attention to this small table, which occupies a place of dignity and honor. It is set for one, symbolizing the fact that members of our armed forces are missing from our ranks. They are referred to as POWs and MIAs. They, we call them comrades. They are unable to be with their loved ones and families. So we join together to pay humble tribute to them and to bear witness to their continued absence. The table is small, symbolizing the frailty of one prisoner alone against his suppressor. The tablecloth is white, symbolizing the purity of their intentions to respond to their nation's call to arms. The single rose in the vase signifies the blood they may have shed in sacrifice to endure the freedoms of our beloved United States of America. The rose also reminds us of the families and friends of our missing comrades who keep faith while awaiting their return. The red ribbon on the vase represents the unyielding determination for a proper accounting of our comrades who are not among us. The slice of lemon on the plate reminds us of their bitter fate. The salt sprinkled on the plate reminds us of, their count, of the countless fallen tears of families as they wait. The glass is inverted. They cannot toast with us tonight. The chair is empty. They are not here. The candle is reminiscent of the light of hope, which lives in our hearts to illuminate their way home, away from their captors to the open harms of a grateful nation. The American flag reminds us as that many of them may never return and have paid the supreme fact sacrifice to ensure our freedom. Let us pray to the supreme commander that all of our comrades will soon be back within our ranks. Let us remember and never forget their sacrifice. May God forever watch over them, protect them, and their families. Tonight marks the 60th anniversary of the day Sergeant James Edmund Johnson was declared killed in action. Um, for the most part, uh, we had forgotten Sergeant Johnson. And this dedication, this ceremony, and the assistance that we've had from the local media is to remind uh, Pocatello who Sergeant Johnson is and how important that he is in our community and that we never forget him again. With us tonight is uh, Stephanie Johnson McKay, Sergeant Johnson's daughter. Next to her is James McKay, Sergeant Johnson's grandson. And on the end of the row, and I apologize to your lovely wife, I had forgotten her name already. Mary. 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 <laughs> Mary and John also, uh, Sergeant Johnson's nephew. Also with us tonight, 
Mayor Brian Blad, Pocatello. Thank you, sir. Mayor Steve England. Uh, County Commissioner Paul Anderson. Uh, or Car <laughs> See? There, there you go. Um, Steve Hadley. And unfortunately, Howard Manwaring was unable to be with us tonight as he has recently undergone surgery and uh, request that you remember him in your prayers this evening. Um, also with us is uh, Kermit Morrison. He is a city councilman for uh, Chubbuck and also represents the uh, veterans of foreign wars. Uh, and uh, Charlene Young, who is a candidate for seat six for Pocatello. Uh, I'd also like to recognize post four American Legion Commander Woody Woodman, uh, District six president and post four auxiliary president for the American Legion Auxiliary, Barbara Wadlow, Marine Corps League, Stephen D. Merrill Detachment 698, Commander Ralph Lillig. We know Stephen D. Merrill is also a fallen hero from Pocatello for whom the detachment is made. He lost his life in Vietnam. <clears throat> uh, also, I'd like to thank John White, our Bannock County Veterans Memorial Association President, Larry Hebden, our Vice President and Non-Commissioned Officers Association, Chapter 888 uh, Chairperson. Uh, Lori Davis, our treasurer, and Eva Ackerman, or Eva Ackerman, our treasurer, Lori Davis, our secretary. Uh, thank you all. Uh, next, I would like to uh, ask, uh, I, think, I think we might have enough room up here, unless you'd be safer down there. Okay. <laughs> uh, Mayor Blad and uh, Mayor England and uh, Commissioner Hadley and Anderson, if they would please come up. As they come up, I would like to extend my sincere appreciation to Mayor Blad. Uh, for far too long, um, Pocatello has been unrepresented uh, by the city at our events. Um, we, are, we had the opening of the Veterans Sanctuary. We also do the Field of Heroes every year in town and nobody was there from Pocatello. Mayor Blyde's election was a godsend to us and he has been there for everything for us. And, and we very, very much appreciate that. I know in confidence you had, told me, you had apologized to me for not being a veteran and I forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> Your support is extremely important. And also, at all these events where, and previously, Mayor England was there at every one, usually alone but now he has a partner in crime for these, <laughs> and we do appreciate that. I'd also like to thank the county commissioners for all their help, and uh, it, it's with their, their assistance that made this possible. Okay. And, that's right, you are a veteran. <laughs> and he also is in charge of us county-wise as far as our funding goes. Um, I'd like to turn this over to uh, Mayor Blad, and can I please have Stephanie and James uh, come up here, and I will get out of your way. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's very kind to say it's indeed an honor for the three of us to be able to be, uh, be here and uh, present this proclamation together. Now, we have, we, uh, a lot of times you'll just have one person read the proclamation, not anymore, not in Pocatello or Chubbuck or Bannock County, I don't believe. If the three of us or the two of us are, are there, then uh, we read it together because we're unified. And it's indeed an honor to be able to do that. I will go ahead and start a proclamation. Whereas James Edmund Johnson was born in Pocatello in 1926. And whereas James joined the United States Marine Corps upon his graduation from high school and was sent to, fly, to flight in the Pacific theater, fight in the Pacific Theater of Operations during World War II, specifically seeing action in Pelu and Okinawa. Whereas on December 2nd, 1950, Sergeant Johnson's courage and selfless action earned him the Congressional Medal of Honor. 
And whereas during the Battle of Chosen Reservoir on that December day, Sergeant Johnson did not hesitate to take charge of his platoon in the absence of their leader. And then, when ordered to displace his platoon, put himself in an ex put himself in an extremely hazardous position in order to provide covering fire and was last seen wounded but still fighting enemy troops and whereas Sergeant Johnson was listed as missing in action after December 2nd 1950 and was then declared killed in action by body not recovered on November 2nd 1953 and whereas Sergeant Johnson heroic, heroic action that day saved the lives of the men in his platoon and earned him, the earned him the United States of America highest military honor for personal acts of valor above and beyond the call of duty. And whereas Sergeant Johnson's actions have been forgotten far too long, and because our city, our county, our state, and our na nation owe much to Sergeant Johnson and wish to remember and honor his brave actions and selfless service to his platoon and his country. Now, therefore, we, the undersigned, do hereby proclaim November 2nd, 2013, to be Sergeant James Edward Johnson Day in Pocatello, Chubbuck, and Bandit County, and urge our citizens to remember and recognize a true American hero for his bravery and for his ultimate sacrifice. That ends the proclamation ceremony. I would like to remind everyone that he gave his life that we might be free in this country. With freedom comes the right to vote. I encourage each, each of you to go out and vote on Tuesday. Please do not go away, Stephanie and James. Thank <laughs> you. Sergeant Johnson's senior year at Pocatello High School was cut short when he got his parents' permission to join the United States Marine Corps and fight for his country during World War II. He did not graduate. I'd like to introduce a special guest, Mr. Cotant, I apologize if I butchered that, uh, Principal Pocatello High. But it's a great honor for Pocatello High School and School District Number 25 to present this diploma to Sergeant Johnson's relatives so that they might have this for their memories. I'd like to read an email that was sent to me by a good friend of Sergeant Johnson who served with him in Korea. From Watson Crumby, Sergeant, United States Marine Corps. I regret that I cannot attend the dedication to James Johnson. I will be with you in thought and Jim will be with you in spirit. Having served with Jim in Korea and at the Chosen Reservoir, I can testify that there is no one more deserving to be honored and recognized. The unit that Jim commanded in an emergency situation at the Chosen Reservoir in, Korea, in North Korea during the winter of 1950 lasted less than 12 hours and disintegrated at dawn when the individuals returned to their specific, uh, respective units. For that reason, there is no written record of it, its existence. What Jim, Jim did during the short time of its existence is documented. He saved the lives of several Marines at the cost of his own. As a result, he was also responsible in thwarting the Chinese attack on a vital position. He is deserving in having bestowed upon him the nation's highest award, the Medal of Honor. It was not only my privilege to have known him, but an honor to have known him as my friend. I was extremely pleased and owe a debt of gratitude to Professor Terence Barrett, who realized the event of so long ago had been forgotten and re wrote, remember James Edmund Johnson, United States Marine Corps, which brought to life Pocatello's number one hero of the Korean War. For all of us to know, honor, and remember, Semper Fidelis, Watson Crumbie, L411, Korea, 1950-51.
With that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Terrence Barrett. It's a privilege to be here. Uh, I'm touched by all of you. Uh, I want to thank Tom Daniels and uh, the association for the invitation to be here. Uh, unexpected, but I'm, I'm glad to be here. As you know, I, I did write a book. I have a lot I could tell you about uh, Jim Johnson. I'm not going to repeat a lot of things that you just heard, but I am going to tell you some things. <clears throat> And I pause now because I pause. <laughs> Remember something that we learned on the first day of our military training. <clears throat> How to salute. Who to salute. Enlisted men and women salute officers. Lower ranking officers salute higher ranking officers. In the Marine Corps, everyone salutes the Commandant. He's a four star general. The salute is not given, it's rendered and it's exchanged. It's not a greeting. It's an immediate sign of respect, exchanged. By observing how a salute is rendered, you can see how much respect is being extended. Some salutes are sloppy and they're given begrudgingly. Most are obligatory and routine. It's just what we do. There are some salutes that are sharp and crisp and they snap. There's a sound like the American flag caught in a breeze. Those are special salutes. The Medal of Honor is a symbol to reflect the highest credit upon the recipient. There is no higher award that can be extended to anyone in America. All the services have set their own standards by which they will recommend this medal. Now I can tell you, uh, I have a little bit of bias about the Marines, so please excuse me for that if you were not a Marine. The Marines believe that anyone who graduates from boot camp is brave. The Marines believe, obviously, anyone who goes away from home and serves in a combat theater is brave. So this medal is special. This bravery must be exemplary. It must be beyond obligation and duty. It must interestingly be distinguished from all common acts of bravery in combat. Can you imagine? Common acts of bravery. The person must obviously have put themselves in peril at risk, uh, potentially to the loss of their life. The actions must be uncontested by those who witness it and beyond criticism. Sergeant Johnson earned this medal. If he had come home from the Chosen Reservoir and stepped into the Pentagon wearing around his neck this medal, everyone in that building would have stood and saluted him, including the Commandant of the Marine Corps, a four-star general. That's the respect due him. The dedication of this room tonight, your presence here, is a salute. Deserved. And as I've witnessed, 
It is sharp and crisp. And the reading of that citation snapped. And I hope it touched you. <clears throat> I also know uh, from what I've learned about Jim Johnson that if he were here and he was witnessing all this, he'd be grinning. That's who he was. There are words in that citation that we should pay attention to. Voluntary, valor, courageously, valiant, undaunted fighting spirit, unfaltering devotion, frightful odds. And he would be grinning. Those words, that citation is a testimony to the young man that Jim Johnson was and the spirit and character he possessed. And he is an example to all of us. So, before I tell you a little bit more about him, what I, I'm going to ask you to do something for me. I want you to imagine that I'm going to ask for you to raise your hands. Show of hands. But I'm not asking you really to do this, so please don't raise your hands. Imagine that I asked, would you raise your hand if you consider yourself to be a brave person? Imagine instead I asked, Look to the person on your right. Look to the person on your left. Would you instead say, now there's a brave person. Bravery and heroism are serious things. And often they're hard to talk about, especially if you're the one being acknowledged. It's been nearly 40 years that I've been talking, listening to men tell what happened in combat. And I know they will acknowledge fear, anger, sorrow, and guilt. Bravery? Not heard it yet. There's a resistance to it. So when I say to a combat veteran, that was brave. I can predict what I'm going to hear. I've heard this often enough. Bravery? I wasn't brave. I was just doing what I had to do. I did what anybody would have done. Remember that citation. Or, I'm not much of a brave person. Or, I'm no more brave than any guy or my favorite. And I have heard this many times. I was in my 20s. I just thought I was being stupid. <laughs> and then the question is posed back to me. Seriously. What exactly is your idea of bravery? Now this is coming from people who are unquestionably brave. That's a reasonable question. It's hard to explain what bravery is because it's determined by actions that are observed. We don't see it necessarily day to day to day. So to say you're brave means I saw you do that. That's brave. But I thought that that question really deserved an answer. So I started studying bravery. I had no intention to write a book. I was studying bravery as a component of therapy for post-traumatic stress. And in order to understand that, I know and understand the Medal of Honor. I also know in my history Iwo Jima. Now all of us know Iwo Jima because of the flag raising. Five Marines and a Navy Corpsman. 
magazine articles, books, movies written about them. We know them. What most people don't know is that there were 22 Marines who earned medals of honor on that island. I knew that and I thought, now here's a place to study bravery. I'll get their citations. I'll read through their citations. I knew some of them by name from history, but I didn't know all of them. There were some in there that uh, had undoubtedly wonderful stories to tell. So 22 citations, and this is what I learned. First of all, there were two that lived nearby me that I never knew, never heard of them. They were within walking distance of my home to a graveyard. Charles Berry being one of them. I make it a point now whenever I go home to stop there. Missed opportunities to know and understand, know their story, be inspired, look up to. The second thing, now I'm taking notes and I'm trying to be scientific and professional so I have to write something down that sounds professional. So I make a note something like this. Bravery that reaches into the range of heroic requires an ordinary strength and courage and appears to be characteristic of the person across time and circumstances all the way back to childhood. That's a question that often comes up. Is this an ordinary person? Would this person be identified in childhood or are they just like everybody else? There's something about them that's identifiable. They are willing to put themselves at risk on behalf of others. And because they do that, there's unordinary outcomes. This is an unordinary outcome. If you think of the numbers of men and women who serve in our military who will never have this, this is an unordinary outcome because of what Sergeant Johnson did. Exemplary. The third thing I learned is reading about bravery, reading about brave people has an impact. It had one on me. When I would try to tell their story, especially Charles Berry who lived nearby, sometimes I would feel goosebumps, other times I would feel a catch in my throat and not unnecessarily feel tears in my eyes. Bravery has an impact. And part of the impact was I wanted to read more. There's 292 Marines, now 294, who've earned this medal. Going all the way back to the Civil War. I had the book, I read their citations. Trying to understand bravery. From that, now the citations as it was read, Unless you have a picture of Jim Johnson reading his citation, you don't know what he looks like. He's a Marine, so I'm picturing square jaw, broad shoulders, muscled. Now fortunately, around this same time, the Marine Corps History Division started profiling their Medal of Honor recipients. Now I go to their website. I selected 181. World War II, 82 men. Korea, 42. Vietnam, 57. Not only their citations, a picture, a photograph, and some biographical information. Hometown, family, names. This is the information I wanted. I want to know what are the influences on anyone to do the things they have done. What makes it exemplary? Where does this come from? So World War II first went through those. The pictures on their uh, profiles, official Marine Corps pictures, often in their blues, sometimes in their greens. Vietnam wasn't like that. Often it was in their boot camp because there wasn't time to get the dress blues. 
Some of them never had an official photograph. It was their high school yearbook picture. But I'm looking at the images, and when I'm in Korea and I get to Jim Johnson, I have to tell you, this picture stopped me. Here is a casual Marine, corporal, in uniform, sitting in one of those olive drab green chairs that stick to you if you're sweaty. And it appeared to me that he was probably waiting for a clerk to pass him his orders. But there was that grin. My reaction, I wonder what he's thinking about. And I heard that over and over again from men who knew him. Whenever you saw him smiling, you wondered what he was up to, because you knew it was something. And at the time, no one knew he was from Pocatello and he was supposed to be doing that. The smile was a constant for him. And that's when I turned strictly to him. I wanted to learn as much as I could. And I was fortunate to meet uh, friends who had served with him, Watson Crumbie being one of them. Uh, Stephanie, I was very fortunate to track down randomly through just sending letters, hoping that someone down in Georgia or Florida might respond to me and say, yes, I'm Jim Johnson's daughter. So you've heard some things about him, his actions. Now I'm going to tell you just a few things about him. There are some things known about his childhood, about the challenges he faced, the family that he grew up in. And I'm going to tell you something about Medal of Honor recipients because they all share this one characteristic. They had challenges in childhood, all of them. They weren't uncommon challenges necessarily, but they had challenges. And if they didn't have enough of them, they created their own. And rather than be overwhelmed, undermined, give up, give in, Jimmy Johnson overcame them. And one of the ways he did that was with humor, lightheartedness, good nature. He had an affiliation for other people. He was drawn to other people and they were drawn to him. Everyone told me everybody liked him. He was a likable person. So here's a couple of examples of creating your own challenges. These are, I, I just want to introduce this to you. Junior high and grade school, his classmates remembered him as one of the shorter boys. So what sport does he play in high school? Basketball. He was strong in his opinions. He liked his opinions. That wasn't good enough. He joined the debate club because he intended his opinion was going to win the day. No one was going to better him in a debate. And if there's any question that he saw a challenge, at the beginning of his senior year at Pocatello High, 17 years old, the war was ongoing, there was some concern that it was almost won, and he went, and dra he went to the draft board and enlisted himself because he wanted to fight for his country and he didn't want to miss the opportunity. So he did fight at Peleliu, he did fight at Okinawa, two of the bloodiest battles towards the end of the war in the Pacific. Came home in 46, he worked at the naval ordnance plant for about 10 months, not challenging enough. Decided to go to college, wanted to be a teacher. Apparently he was an excellent math teacher. Well, he'd have to be, he was an artilleryman, he needed to know numbers and how they worked. He went to college for a year, not challenging enough, Re-enlisted in the Marine Corps. Went to Quantico in June. Met a woman who was bedazzled by him. He to her. 
And then there's something else you should know about him. Teachers would say he was smart. He was independent. He liked to do things on his own. And he was self-confident. Now think of adolescents and young males in marine uniforms. Self-confident, she saw it. He was cocky. <laughs> and they married, they had a daughter, July 22nd, 1950. Stephanie's born, Jim leaves five days later for Korea. Another challenge. He volunteered for combat duty even though he did not have to go. The Marines at the Chosen Reservoir would say he was as cocky as ever. Undaunted by the circumstances, smiling through the cold of it all. Imagine. So when Jim stands up for his platoon, he has AK-47 bullets across his chest. There's grenades going off all around him. He has an understanding of likely the outcome of this. Now he had spent time making sure casualties were taken down the hill. Didn't have to do that. There were injured Marines around him. He ensured they were down the hill and not left there. He gathered grenades knowing that the others were going to be sent back to the line. He took their grenades knowing what he was going to do. And he sent them back standing in front of them as they went down the hill. Unfaltering devotion. So why is it important to remember James Edmund Johnson? He is a reflection of what is best in America. He is a demonstration of the character we seek. And I do worry sometimes today when I see the heroes are young men and women, the character that these individuals have that they are looking up to and wanting to imitate. Sergeant Johnson presents to us a picture of true character. His hometown, his school, and most definitely his family share in the honor that he brought here. God bless all of you and God bless America.